Welcome to our panel discussion on experiments, disruptions, affordances, practices for future innovations, brought to you from the Advanced Digital Design and Fabrication at Plus F Research Hub at the Melbourne School of Design at the University of Melbourne. My name is Associate Professor Rochus Hinkel. I'm one of the three co-directors of the Research Hub. The other two co-directors, Dr. Paul Lowe and Claire Asensio, are to my left. So I would, like to welcome, I would like to acknowledge all the traditional owner of the ancient land on which we currently convene this panel. Uh, from us here in Melbourne, Australia, the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin nations. We acknowledge that the land, seas and sky were never ceded and pay our deepest respects to the elders past, present and emergent. So my name is Paul Lowe. I'm a senior lecturer in digital architecture design here at Melbourne School of Design. And I also would like to welcome our audience and our guests to tonight's discussion. My name is Leila Asensio, and I'm also a senior lecturer here at the MSD. I'll start by welcoming some of our guests tonight. With us are Dr. Areti Marco Polo from the Institute for Advanced Architecture in Catalonia, the IAC in Barcelona, and Associate Professor Paul Nicolas from the Center for Information Technology and Architecture, CETA, at the Royal Danish Academy in Copenhagen. From Melbourne, we welcome to the discussion Professor Flora Salim from the Center for Information Discovery in Data Analytics, CIDA, at RMIT University, and Dr. Gagana Rusinova from the Faculty of Health, Arts and Design at Swinburne University of Technology. And from our research hub, we have with us tonight Associate Professor Dominic Hoxha and Dr. George Senogovic. The research undertaken by all our presenters ranges from artistic experiments to problems and demand oriented experiment investigations. Each presenter will start with an opening statement on their approach to innovation and research. This will be followed by conversations with our hub members on questions related to design and innovation. What are the processes and methods that lead to innovation? What are the different experiences on how to innovate? how to make discoveries. In short, the question we are investigating is how to innovate. To conclude the evening discussion, we will allow 20 to 30 minutes for an overall panel discussion. But before we start, I'd just like to clarify or remind that tonight's discussion, we are not seeking for a recipe or a formula for innovation. This panel is more about an exchange and a conversation from which we hope that you, our audience, and we on the panel can gain some insights for further reflections on what maybe is a really important topic for all of us, the question around the practice of innovation. So here with, here with I would like to start the first round of statements and discussion with Dr. Areti Marco Polo and Professor Flora Salim. This will be followed by a conversation with Associate Professor Dominic Holzer and myself. So Areti Marco Polo is a Greek architect researcher and urban technologies working at the intersection between architecture and digital technologies. She's uh, the academic director at AYA in Barcelona, where she also leads the Advanced Architecture Group. Her research and practice focus on redefining the architecture of cities through an ecological and technological spectrum, combining design with biotechnologies, new materials, digital fabrication, and big data. Areti is co-founder of the Art Tech Gallery Studio P52, and co-editor of Urban Next, a global network focused on rethinking architecture through the contemporary urban milieu. Areti is the founder and chair of the Responsive Cities International Symposium in Barcelona and has served as head curator of a wide number of international exhibitions. She has also recently been appointed together with Lydia Calipoliti, the head curator for the Tallinn Architecture Biennale 2022. So without any further ado, please help me welcome Areti Marco Polo tonight. Thank you, Leila. Thank you, everybody, for the kind invite. I think it's um, it's a great virtual place uh, and, and a great gathering to speak about um, innovations, uh, innovation, about um, uh, disruption, about design. And since we are speaking about um, innovation, let me start by highlighting um, the necessity uh, to innovate in architecture and the built environments. The digital um, revolution coupled with the challenges that we are facing today, environmental, economical or social challenges, 
uh, urge architecture to uh, seek much of the traditions that um, uh, upon which it operated for the last decades, if not uh, centuries. Allow me to share the screen so some of our images can follow my short statement. I think that uh, what I would like to share uh, today in this short statement is the fact that um, design combined with uh, multidisciplinary science, um, they are two powerful tools for architecture uh, to revolutionary innovate and, and therefore bring a positive impact and, and a change to the built environment. In our work at IAC in Barcelona, uh, we experiment, for instance, uh, and, and we learn from different kinds of sciences, from synthetic biology, nature, material science, computer numerical control construction, data science, or social sciences, for instance. And um, learning from uh, synthetic biology and nature, for example, architecture can innovate um, by redefining uh, built environments and cities as living organisms, organisms that are able to filter, uh, generate energy, generate other resources such as food, self-regulate the temperature, while at the same time they operate in a circular metabolism driven by principles of uh, resource production, um, uh, reuse and, and upcycle. Uh, we can also uh, learn from material science and computer numerical uh, control construction. Uh, in, in this case, um, uh, innovation in the architectural building technology, such as robotic or additive manufacturing, uh, therefore 3D printing, can open the pathway for quick, uh, low cost and 100% natural uh, constructions for urban and, and rural areas. And this is uh, something very important in, in the current, uh, let's say, challenge of, of housing and accessibility we are facing. Then um, uh, some other examples include learning from data science and, and social science. Um, in this case, architecture can innovate incorporating uh, technologically mediated participatory processes for uh, citizen inclusion uh, in, in design and then planning decision-making processes. And uh, in order to empower innovation uh, in our, um, let's say, pedagogy, we are following two strategies. On the one uh, hand, the importance uh, of acting in multiple scales, scales when designing, and on the other hand, the necessity to integrate multiple disciplines. I think this is very, very crucial to, to, to have it in mind when we are um, operating in, in academy and, and research environment. Um, in our programs and in our work, we incorporate teaching and project realization from the very small material uh, scale to building design, from sensors and physical computing to the strategic uh, development of master plans to what we call from bits to geographies. And then additionally, our programs run in um, close collaboration with uh, specialists from diverse fields. Um, we don't only have groups and teams of architects and designers, but also biologists, uh, engineers, anthropologists, sociologists, arborists or permaculturers, uh, and of course, programmers, manufacturers, economists, and, and policy makers. And uh, next to a multidisciplinary and a multiscalar approach, I also want to highlight the importance of um, setting up an appropriate space, both physical but intellectual space as well to allow innovation to happen. Our model uh, is based on, on learning out of making, and on peer-to-peer -peer learning. And therefore the goal of IAC Academy when it comes to innovation and pedagogy uh, is precisely to teach how to learn, you know, uh, in a kind of a bottom-up way and peer-to-peer and -peer learning um, and how the tools can be found. You no, know? this is very important uh, when we are teaching to a wide range of um, multidisciplinary students um, that, that uh, visit our institute. And then we, uh, we have um, uh, a big laboratory. We let our students get their hands dirty, uh, test, fail, 
test again uh, and learning from prototyping and from their, fa their failures as well. And uh, we often um, uh, offer a space of uh, experimentation, we call it a factory of knowledge, uh, a laboratory of creation. And, and uh, if um, anybody has visited our place, uh, you must know that uh, we are uh, based on a warehouse, which is far beyond, uh, let's say, the traditional sterilized classrooms. And, and this kind of spaces um, for me um, uh, are very important in order to allow the merging of creativity, design, um, uh, and science for producing uh, innovative ideas. And then, um, of course, uh, learning from science, having appropriate spaces, um, multidisciplinary and multi-scale approach cannot uh, stand alone without uh, the necessity of producing pilot projects um, and therefore collaborating um, with public and private bodies. So part of these ideas that are generated in our laboratory that can go outside, uh, we should use our city as a laboratory in order to test these ideas um, and in order to um, be able to evaluate um, these ideas in terms of social impact, in terms of financial, uh, let's say, uh, feasibility, and, and of course, uh, in terms of cultural meaning. And um, we recognize, let's say, the importance of using the latest technological means um, to develop novel ideas but always focusing on the current social, economic, and environmental challenges. So rather than just exploring technologies to test their limits or potential, um, our students and faculty, and I think this is important, we need to envision and materialize solutions for the increasing uh, challenges our society is facing. De developing, therefore, research and um, innovative uh, projects around social manifestos should become more relevant than doing so around technological manifestos without, of course, one discarding the other. And um, summing up, um, I want to highlight then that rather than just exploring technologies to test their limits or potentials, architecture is urged to innovate by learning and posing the appropriate questions for a radical positive impact in the way we live and in the way we interact. We therefore need to make these appropriate uh, and correct questions um, in order to innovate and technologies uh, will become an ally and will become the means for developing um, novel innovative solutions that will allow us to restore uh, the effects of our human impact in both our planet, but as well as our society. So um, no more to add to this uh, st short statement. I hope uh, in our discussion, we will have some possibilities to further elaborate in some of these uh, points uh, that I have shared with you. Thanks so much, Areti. This was great. Um, my name is Dominic Holzer. It is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Flora Salim. She's professor in the School of Computing Technologies, uh, the co-deputy director of the RMIT Center of uh, Information Discovery and Data Analytics, and an associate investigator of the AFC Center of Excellence in Automated Decision-Making and Society. Uh, Flora leads the Context Re uh, Recognition and Urban Intelligence uh, Group, and her research expertise includes human behavior, modeling, time series data mining, machine learning on stream and sensor data, and ubiquitous computing. I met Flora in, I believe it was 2008, um, back at the Spatial Information Architecture Lab at, at RMIT. And it was already back then, it was very clear that she was a very driven uh, individual who in particular with the work she does with her background in computer science, uh, aims to break through professional boundaries and academic boundaries, really aims to look at synergies between different areas of research. And that has taken her around the world, you could say, with a number of awards and, and fellowships. She had um, the hum Humboldt Bio Fellowship, the Humboldt uh, Fellowship, the Victoria Fellowship, uh, the RMIT Vice Chancellor's um, Award for Research Excellence as an early career researcher, and also the um, RMIT Award for Research Impact in Technology. My great pleasure to introduce Flora and I'm handing over to you. Thank you very much, Dom. And uh, it's such a great pleasure to, to be here and actually 
give a, a brief of what we're actually doing and uh, our approaches to uh, innovation and impact. So let me just share uh, my screen here. So today my talk will be about data driven discoveries and innovation with machine learning. So the first thing uh, to consider is interesting problem doesn't come all the time. So when we're actually working with uh, an interesting problem, innovations will come. So uh, I'm always very interested in working with new, significant and interesting problems. And this is when we actually especially work with people beyond our disciplines, not just computer scientists working uh, and talking about uh, new innovation among themselves, but when we actually collaborate with architects, with urban designers, planners, and those who actually make our cities great. Now, um, my with my special background, I guess, um, in especially special, because when I actually work with you guys, uh, especially it's a bit different uh, when we bring a new insight from data sets. So how do we discover interesting signals from data sets? And I'll, I'll like to actually give you a couple of examples from some of our projects. And we always, we always aim to discover the unexpected from big data, small data, thick data. So they're all different, obviously, it could be to do with the volume, veracity on the speed, or it could be small to do because it's only a couple of subjects or participants, or it could be thick because it is longitudinal data uh, taken from multiple months and years. Now, consider users uh, of uh, smartphone devices uh, and that's actually uh, including all of us, not just uh, the lady on our screen at the moment, but um, someone has a need as they look at the phone. And can we actually make uh, uh, the experience with the device that she's having better? And even, even as she's interacting with the city, she might be looking for a, a restaurant or a place to go to. Uh, can this be uh, made more seamless to her? And how do we understand human behaviors and is their interesting needs uh, with heterogeneous sensor data in the wild? And these sensor data are available widely, not only because of uh, the interesting um, you know, uh, signals that we can get from Internet of Things in our cities, but also actually there's so much sensors already that uh, you know, are carried by humans in forms of smartphones, wearables, smartwatches, so we can actually tap into them uh, as, uh, you know, if we consider humans as sensors. So I'm always very passionate about learning from data. And it is very important, though, to make a human centric and, data, uh, and, and any, any kind of new innovation with AI, in data driven AI, it, it needs to be aimed at deliver, delivering actionable insights for our collaborators, for our partners, for our clients. Now, a couple of uh, examples. So uh, I'm just going to show you a couple of examples in, our collab in collaboration with architects or engineers or urban planners or transport planners. So uh, in this pro uh, project co-funded by ARC and Oricon, we're very interested in understanding human behaviors better uh, using sensors, sensor data uh, in the wild. And in here, even just using smartphone sens sensors can actually um, uh, predict human personality, the big five personality traits. And uh, the answer is yes, it's possible. So this was actually um, picked up a lot by the news uh, because we found that uh, interesting things like, for example, some of the traits using mobile uh, interaction with mobile devices, female neuroticism that's marked by, uh, you know, changes of movement on a mobile device to, uh, towards late at past midnight and things like that. So um, you can read the paper for more details. Uh, more recent work, just uh, published actually last month at KDD 2021, we actually uh, published a new deep learning technique that doesn't require any labeled data from smartphone uh, respiratory um, sounds to actually predict COVID related symptoms. So again, this is a, a doesn't use any sensors that to be installed at home or work uh, places, just using audio signals captured from the phone. Uh, here is in a work in collaboration with Arab, uh, where we actually predict uh, workers' concentration and stress um, at different work zones in their offices. So you might know in Arab Melbourne, they used to be in Orica, um, and also they moved to uh, Docklands. And we, we actually built a multi-factor predictive models for their workspaces. So we could actually realize uh, the, the different factors 
uh, this different symbiotic factors between people and their work environment. And then we can project uh, their um, productivity as well. So this is a bit like Netflix recommender system. Can we actually recommend uh, better work areas for workers? And uh, in this, this project with Oricon and in collaboration with Swinburne as well, we uh, collected lots of data from wearables and inf infrastructure sensors in order to understand how students are engaged in classrooms. It, and this data was collected in, um, in actually in a high school. So if you look at uh, these ones here, um, by using uh, our understanding by uh, an engagement, for example, CO2 sensors uh, uh, that picked up poor air quality in the afternoon that actually lead to lower engagement. And that can actually be used by architects to better design classrooms with uh, um, automated uh, ventilation in the afternoon, especially, for example. So we can learn a lot of different behavior factors that can make people more happy in classrooms or more engaged. And finally, in here, as I said before, there are two approaches to innovation, yeah. either using data and try to find interesting signals from data, or if it's, you can also start from, from a problem, if the problem itself might be already interesting. So in, in this uh, project, what's very interesting about it is we actually didn't have enough data. We need to use UAV to collect data about crowd situations. So how, how can we monitor crowds uh, in, let's say, FIFA World Cup? In a project collaboration with QMIC, a Qatar Mobility Innovation Center, we deliver an efficient crowd counting algorithm using only low resolution drone images on the edge. So I'd like to thank my PhD students and postdocs in my group because all of these works are basically a lot of their hard work. Thank you. Thank you, both Areti and Flora. So, um, Dominique, if, unless you have any pressing questions, maybe I jump in and ask uh, a first question. My first question is actually for, for Areti. Um, again, thank you very much for, for a very inspiring presentation, I, I have to say. Um, something that uh, to me is very interesting in, in the way that I see your institution um, uh, operating is that everything seems to be a, a globally f a bounded, basically, or framed by a series of sort of global questions that then seem to be pursued through a very particular set of projects, scales, I guess, research groups within your institution, etc. And as a kind of, as an academic director of, of IAC, I was wondering how do you tend to curate this or, or how, what is the kind of culture of the institution that, um, that uh, when presented seems to be all pretty um, kind of um, in a way um, uh, curated or very kind of, uh, it seems that the different research groups seem to feed into each other quite uh, nicely. So I suppose there are a series of either conversations about what you are kind of researching into, et cetera, or certain uh, curatorial aspect from, from um, you on how to um, uh, organize basically this uh, different kind of research streams within the, with, within the IAC. So I was wondering if you could, you know, elaborate a little bit on that uh, for us. Um, yeah, thanks, Leire. Uh, I think this might be a question that uh, could take like um, much time to elaborate and explain. But uh, very quickly, I, I also need to say that sometimes it feels that uh, things are more bottom up than top down in terms of curation. So uh, we, we are very much um, um, as, as, um, as uh, a team of research groups working towards a common goal, which is to redefine the future of our cities. And when we are talking about cities, we uh, always try to understand um, uh, the idea of cities and all the complex layer that consists, uh, um, uh, let's say uh, the city in, in, um, uh, in a very wide uh, spectrum, right? We are not only dealing with building technologies, we are not only dealing with uh, construction processes, we want to understand um, a much more uh, complex um, uh, social phenomena. We want to understand and to explore uh, the potential of technology um, as a means to serve people. No? And, uh, and I think that this becomes a kind of a global uh, or transversal uh, line of research. And then we have different kinds, different scales of operation from um, um, 
from um, material experimentation, as I was saying, to different, uh, let's say, research streams of uh, digital manufacturing, um, performative and intelligent buildings, but also territorial or ecological, let's say, approaches uh, in the wider scale. So um, we always, um, uh, let's say, um, meet in order to serve um, radical ideas that sometimes uh, they they might uh, they might look a bit uh, unreal, uh, but when we start experimenting with much more uh, let's say concrete ways and methodologies, then these um, um, ideas start to become uh, short. Uh, I mean, tools and and processes of specific projects, and I think that one one. Um, one important uh, aspect that we all share at IAC is that we are never trying to explain a project just from one point of view. No, we need to understand each research uh, project, how it affects, as I was saying, different uh, scales, but also uh, different um, um, social groups, uh, different um, industry realities. And, and I think that this holistic approach um, helps to, you know, uh, increase the impact that some of our work um, uh, could have, rather than being enclosed in, in a laboratory where we only dialogue with uh, experts and people that they do similar work. Uh, we always try to provoke uh, groups and people that they don't speak our language, that they don't do our projects. And, and we try to see how our ideas could fit their needs. Uh, how are our ideas yes. could get feedback from their, uh, let's say, uh, necessities um, and desires, and and how we can eventually, uh, yeah. let's say, create a more collective process of of designing uh, and uh, implementation. I have a question because it's probably a comment to start off with. For me, what was interesting about both presentations and the work that we've seen is that it's clearly about the relationships between humans and their environments and the way we can use data to investigate, interrogate, and then adjust and adopt and, and kind of, in, yeah, look, look into that relationship a bit more closer to maybe even force some changes or, or, or suggest some changes to be a bit softer. Um, and so it's in a way a question maybe first to Areti, but then also leading over to Flora and, and, and her work. How do you see that uh, that particular aspect evolving as part of, of what it is that you do? Well, I think you nailed it because it is about um, um, humans and the environment that surrounds humans, but it's also about non-humans. You know, sometimes um, we do design for other species as well, or we should design in a kind of a more symbiotic way um, um, what we are uh, designing and, and, and constructing. So in this sense, I believe that on the one hand, we have the human experience. Uh, we have uh, the connection of, of humans with the environment. I think Flora showed some very interesting work on how uh, data uh, and, and uh, monitoring could help us better understand our urban environment. Sometimes I used to, to uh, promote work that it's not only based on quantitative data, but also qualitative ones. Things that a sensor cannot measure, uh, needs, feelings, uh, desires. I think this becomes very, very fundamental when we're talking about humans and their environment, how they perceive the environment, what do they desire, give them knowledge on what is the impact of their desires so that lifestyle can also change. Because if people uh, get uh, feedback um, uh, and knowledge of the impact of their behavior, then it's very possible that they will change these behaviors or that they will adapt their needs. I think this is important. So on the one hand, everything related with qualitative and quantitative uh, data about humans and, and the environment, but also on the other hand, um, try to produce um, um, design ideas and solutions that they don't only meet humans needs no in order to as i was saying in my short uh, initial statement in order to restore our human impact in the planet we need to be able to design beyond ourselves we need to be able to create an architecture that is not only adding value to our needs as humans but also to the needs of the environment to the uh, needs of other species 
we need to st stop creating this kind of dichotomy between artificial and natural, between um, um, the city and the rural, uh, between uh, the built environment and, and, and the landscape. And, and I think that this um, might mark uh, the future of, of our cities and our design discipline in, in, um, uh, in order to uh, minimize, let's say, the negative in impact that our current construction uh, industry uh, has. Mm -hmm. Flora? Thank you. That's an excellent comment and also question. Um, it is very important that uh, whatever we do is actually user centric. So uh, regardless, whoever the users are, either human or as Arati mentioned, could be animals too, or you know, a, a, the li every living beings that we can consider. So um, uh, I think what is important here uh, is using uh, data. We can provide evidence in the decision making processes that is actually um, not just observable, but can be projected. Uh, a lot of, uh, uh, I mean, I, I learn a lot by uh, working with uh, um, uh, architects and designers uh, that there's a lot of, uh, you know, you often don't start with the, uh, you know, the question. So finding the question itself is a journey. And, and um, I actually, uh, and a lot of uh, people like us from the technology, engineering and computer science, we start with a problem. So a very well-defined problem definition. Um, and, and for me, this is, um, uh, this is a process that both can be done informed by the data. So um, if, uh, if we can actually learn uh, and design, for example, in an intervention to make lives better, to make you know, dwelling better, can, can make our cities better, um, but do we know what is the impact of that design? Do we know the impact of a, a certain intervention to let's say health, right? Um, public health, for example, or uh, convenience um, uh, and all those things. Um, how do we measure it? it? It is very important as artists mentioned, there's a lot of nuances from qualitative data. So we in fact uh, capture this too. It is not only using sensor data, but for example, we can use big data from social media as sensors. So all the nuances uh, that we can get from social media, from Twitter, uh, we can also ask people, we can prompt and ask and create a sort of like crowdsourcing survey uh, in order to actually understand. But, but in order not to use our waste our resources, we need to know how to target the, the right population, how to ask the right questions. And therefore, everything needs to be driven from historical and the data that we already know. And uh, we can also perform not just correlation analysis, but also causality. Understanding, for example, if you're making a, a design changes from A to B, and we're monitoring the variable of changes between, from A to B, um, what, what are the effects of those changes to individuals, to the population? And also um, uh, then we can then improve the design process. Thank do, you. Do you, feel, do you feel that designers struggle sometimes with the with data as, as they don't necessarily, you mentioned thick data. I, for instance, wouldn't even know what that is. And as a designer, it sounds a bit scary. Uh, it sounds sexy as well, but but I don't know. But but because I don't know about it much, it is something that I guess we need to learn uh, to include more in our decision-making. Well, it is not a widely known term anyway, so don't hold yourself for that, Tom. Um, it's, uh, it's basically a data that, I mean, this kind of data that has become more, um, people think it's the future uh, of AI, which is digital biomarkers. So things uh, uh, that have actually, you know, um, sort of like characterize yourself. Like I, I have alluded to it really briefly, even just using accelerometer and gyroscopes data from the smartphones, they can be used if they're modeled correctly, they can be used to predict somebody's personality trait. Um, uh, things like, uh, you know, the usage of the uh, wearable sensors uh, with uh, high school students that we did. We can actually know the type of subjects uh, and the type of condition in the classroom that makes them more emotionally engaged or behaviorally engaged in terms of cognition as well. Um, so these are the digital biomarkers and they collected over normally longer period of time uh, from maybe a very small number of subjects uh, because you know maybe you can't afford to 
collect data from uh, many participants in a lot of trials. Uh, but these become uh, what I call thick, not big data. If, if I may add uh, um, a short thought on that, Dominique, I think um, when it comes to big or thick data, um, there are two important aspects, in my opinion, um, that they also become responsibilities, especially for designers. So on the one hand, we need to understand that what you just said, no, it's like very difficult for big part of designers to understand how they can work with data or to even, you know, try to um, uh, analyze how processes of machine learning or, or, or AI operate. And, and I think that uh, if designers have difficulties, imagine society and, and plain citizens, what kind of difficulties they might have in, 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 um, in grasping uh, this um, uh, concepts. So on the one hand, I believe that designers have the responsibility to um, um, get deep into understanding how we, we can work with data because we cannot, uh, let's say, allow our discipline to continue operating in a kind of a very only intuitive uh, uh, process. We need to have this process uh, being formed by, uh, by different kind of data. Uh, on, the, on the other hand, when we are more aware, then we need to raise awareness and help uh, our, our, let's say, users on understanding how this data will affect um, their, their environment, no? their, their city, their building, um, uh, their neighborhood. So there is a double responsibility for the designers. And then on, on the other hand, I also think it's a very crucial aspect um, to understand that when we design with data, there is by default a bias in this process because what kind of data we decide to use and what kind of data we decide to overlap in order to start having certain conclusions about, you know, like the livability of a neighborhood or the sustainability of certain buildings. Um, all these processes, they are by default biased, no? And, 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 and sometimes the sources from where we extract data, they are also uh, partially, let's say, um, uh, incomplete. So this is another thing that we need to take into consideration in our processes in a very transparent way to uh, acknowledge that uh, in our design processes, but also to acknowledge that in our final, uh, let's say, result or variations of results, because that uh, allows a kind of a, of a flexible space where dialogue could happen rather than a, a final, let's say, decision or a final um, uh, selection of the designers, uh, of the designer. And I think this is where the richness of that process could actually um, um, uh, be in, in, in terms of, of, of new design processes and collective design processes. Thank you, Areti and Flora. We're gonna certainly come back to that conversation. We're gonna move on to our second um, conversation with uh, Gagana Rusanova and Paul Nicholas. It's my great pleasure to uh, welcome Dr. Paul Nicholas from CETA. Um, he is Associate Professor. CETA stands for the Center for Information Technology and Architecture at the Royal Danish Academy of Fine Art in Copenhagen. And he's the director of the International Master's Program Computation and Architecture. Paul Nicholas Research develops new methods for architectural design and fabrication based on digital information flows between predictive modeling, registration and making. His current research response to the need um, to shift architecture's material culture and explores how sensing and machine learning can be linked to robotic fabrication to enable extended sustainable and bio-based architectural production. So welcome, Paul, and hand over to you for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, introduction, Rockus. Um, it's a real pleasure to be with everyone, uh, to be here with everyone uh, today and to be sharing this discussion about uh, innovation, experimentation and disruption. Uh, I'll just share my, share my presentation. Fantastic. So um, 
As Rock has introduced, I'm a researcher within the um, a research group CETA, the Centre for Information Technology and Architecture. Uh, we have a particular uh, focus on the use of digital fabrication uh, to enable new materialization processes. Processes that leverage uh, models of material behavior uh, to steer uh, architectural performance and expression. Uh, we approach architectural perform uh, digital practice really as a ground, uh, grounded research question. Uh, so this means to understand how computers are changing our societies socially, culturally, and technologically, uh, not only creating new tools and new methods, but also really fundamentally changing the way that we think, design, and build architecture. Um, so for us, conceptually, um, the model and thinking innovatively about the model uh, is really a place of central interest. Um, the model is a way to achieve better, more integrated, more creative, and more sustainable building practices. Um, so where we might often think of the model maybe as a means simply for greater efficiency uh, and organization, um, really for us here, uh, we, we see that there is so much more at stake, and that's particularly around architecture's material culture. Um, what you see here is a collection of some of our recent demonstrators. Uh, for us, it's incredibly important uh, to work through making, to always work in parallel between digital and, and physical uh, methods. Um, on the one hand, as a way to innovate, but also as a way to communicate um, our results uh, and their importance and meaning to a, to a broader architectural uh, public. Um, so for the last years, our thinking has really been focused on, um, I suppose, innovation by optimization and technical materials. Uh, and that's our thinking and also much of the computational community. Really a core argument um, for digitization has been about increasing efficiency uh, to enable the reduction of resource. So this is thinking that uh, we have been engaged with for perhaps 10 years and which is now really being disrupted. Uh, and that is occurring because um, we are uh, of several things. We're aware that we are in the midst of an urgent uh, climate emergency. And we're also aware that architecture and construction are major contributors to this through the use and processing of raw resources. The efficiencies of optimization are perhaps no longer sufficient. And we're beginning to, to realize that we need to move from a dependence on the geosphere of non-renewable materials uh, to the biosphere of renewable materials. And this is particularly interesting for us because it opens pathways, new pathways for innovation, um, which begin to move beyond well-known industrial standards and into territories, um, uh, into territories that are much less known and where levels of uncertainty are much higher. Um, so we are beginning uh, a series of experiments at CETA that engage in the idea of data-rich practices for biomaterials. Um, this is extremely early work. Uh, it's also work that I think we are still ourselves beginning to become comfortable with and understand what, what it means. Um, but conceptually, uh, we're developing a three-part perspective for understanding uh, that intersection, so understanding harvested materials, designed materials, and living materials as distinct categories of digital material practice, each of which require distinct computational and fabrication approaches. Um, and so uh, I'll, I'll now just briefly show you three selected experiments from that. But first note that each of these experiments, um, yeah, is in, is in its early stages, uh, but also is really um, only enabled because of the multidisciplinary collaborations um, that, we are, that we're undertaking with them, uh, and also the deep links into our um, master's education here at the Danish Academy where research-led teaching is really central 
to the pedagogy uh, and central to both the ideation and also some of the, um, some of the thinking uh, within these experiments. Um, so experiments with harvested timber uh, explored the potential of bridging the gap between detailed material data, uh, data that is currently collected in sawmills, uh, and to connect that into the design process uh, where it is not available to the architect as a way to be able to use more of the tree and to put the right pieces of wood in the right way. At the moment, up to 70% of, uh, of timber can be wasted uh, in the production of engineered uh, timber lines. Here are some of the early demonstrators um, testing uh, both the uh, structural um, expression, but also some uh, structural performance, but also some of the architectural expression that begins to emerge um, around, and tectonics that begins to emerge around these territories. Uh, in the project predicting response, we're working with cellulose space printing, working with, um, with uh, end of life uh, materials, um, particularly coming from paper, coming from clothing, coming also from the bark, which you saw in the previous project. Uh, and then using sensing and machine learning as a way to track those materials over time during fabrication so that their behavior can be managed and steered within the fabrication process and also later in use. Uh, here is uh, uh, some shots of some of those, um, some of those sensing. I think a very interesting thing about this project at the moment is that it is very much focused on developing methodologies. So methodologies for gathering and processing material data. Um, and then lastly, uh, to work with the living, um, we're beginning to explore fabrication for and with living materials. Um, this is very much also early stage, uh, early stage work. Uh, and again, focused on developing design insights, methodologies, fabrication uh, regimes uh, that enable us to work um, in, in sterile ways with living materials, but also enable us to start to track the behavior of those materials in, uh, in the environments that we can fabricate. Uh, so this is the end of my short presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, thanks very much. It was a really inspiring presentation. Thanks very much for uh, sharing your uh, uh, recent work. I'm sure there will be a lot of questions uh, coming up. I am uh, Georgi Stojanovic, a senior lecturer here at uh, Melbourne School of Design. And my pleasure is to introduce our fourth and final guest for tonight, uh, Gergana Rusinova, who is a lecturer in architecture at Swinburne. Uh, before that, she obtained her uh, PhD degree from um, uh, Chair of Architecture and Digital Fabrication at ETH uh, Zurich under the professors uh, Gramazio and Koller. And previously, she graduated from Integrated Technologies in our Architectural Design Research Program at University of Stuttgart in Germany under the supervision of professors Menges and uh, Knippers. I hope we'll hear uh, some of that work from her and uh, I'll hand it over to uh, Gergana for her presentation. Thanks, George, and thanks for the introduction. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be among such a great group of researchers and um, innovators. My talk today is going to be a reflection on my PhD uh, research at Grammatio Koda Research. Um, my PhD was based on a 3D printing process at an architectural scale using a robotic arm. If we zoom into the individual steps, you'd see that the robot is following a digitally generated pattern to extrude textile string. After that, it places a small amount of crushed stones at the center of each pattern loop. And the funniest step I find is that little hammer jamming the matter together and equalizing the surface and so on. And, and so uh, the process goes on and on layer by layer. I joined the project in 2016 and contributed to the development of this innovative building material system with crushed stone. 
in close collaboration with my former colleague Petros Lindstrom and other members of Chromatio Code Research Group, we developed a digital design and fabrication workflow to transform a pile of crushed stones into full-scale building components. Back in 2017, as any invention is in, in, in its early stages, the project offered more questions than solutions. For example, the first time we opened it up to the public, people were really curious to feel how stable our structures are. As good scientists, we conducted multiple experiments uh, to try and answer this question. And some of the experiments required an interdisciplinary approach based on procedures from the field of structural engineering. Now we're looking at samples being compressed with 20 tons. And many of us did not really expect that that will work and the samples won't break, but they didn't. We also discovered that inventors sometimes need rather simple tools to make a point. A state-of-the-art robotic arm or a broom in this case, it doesn't really matter as long as the experiment leads to useful conclusions. Sometimes the best innovations are actually humble and cheap, done by accident or under playful and creative conditions. All of these experiments allowed us to convince people that we are ready for an outdoor project that is accessible to the public. We built this exhibition piece on a public square in Switzerland. We used a robotic arm mounted on a mobile platform and came up with a system to localize the, ro the robot in space. We then started the construction process. We built for 28 long days under the steel canopy and interacted with people that were just walking by on a daily basis. The project was realized with the help of many great colleagues and friends. And so innovation is a collective effort after all. In the last step, we hammered in these anchor plates and placed the steel structure on top of our 3D printed columns. The roof was in total 8.6 tons. It was designed in a way so people won't be intimidated to walk underneath it. The structure was exhibited for a month and it was fully accessible to visitors during the day. Sometimes the impact of innovation is helpful. It makes our lives easier or better. And sometimes it makes us face our fears or question statements that we take as absolute truth. So innovation can be quite disruptive in this sense. In the case of our project, there are a few questions which might disrupt traditional architectural concepts. For example, can we live in a house made of loose matter? Is that scary? Can this construction process be regulated? And just as you see it now, like this structure being fully reversed, are buildings supposed to be permanent? Our aim was to showcase that using digital design and fabrication tools, simple materials can be utilized for building components that are load bearing and, the same, and at the same time fully recyclable. Last but not least, affordance is a purpose, a thing that can have. And so many ask, can we really build with this material? The answer is that I don't fully know. There are so many other and very exciting problems that are left to solve. And that is okay because innovation in many cases is a gradual evolutionary process with multiple actors contributing to it. Recently, I read a book called How Innovation Works by Matt Ridley. There he says, innovation is not equal to invention. Innovation is workable and affordable invention that is useful to society. The project I showed today is probably still in its early phase of invention. However, I hope we challenge some of the traditional ideas of what a load-bearing wall or column can be. The findings on the load-bearing capacity of our material system were picked up by colleagues at ETH 
who are now working on a sustainable road building process based on our material system. So maybe an invention in one field can lead to a faster innovation in another. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Gergana. Uh, it was a really uh, interesting presentation. Uh, I think we are uh, moving on to uh, uh, discussion a bit, and uh, I get the honor to ask the first question. And in preparing for uh, this conversation, I thought about asking a really simple question, and that is, how are you finding it in uh, Melbourne, uh, Australia? And I'll explain myself, although this sounds like a very general question here. What I want to ask is that you've spent time in two world's uh, leading um, uh, labs uh, when it comes to uh, uh, robotics and uh, digital fabrication, uh, dealing with uh, building material in a very peculiar way. Now that you have moved on with your career and um, uh, you've moved on to a new country and the new um, uh, environment, and it happens that is the same country where we are broadcasting and where uh, Melbourne School of Design is, uh, is based, I'm interested to hear how do you how do you see the next um, uh, move and how do you see your career progressing uh, comparing the setup that you had uh, over there in uh, uh, Stuttgart and in Zurich uh, compared to what your ambitions are and what's uh, what's the next step? Yeah, that's actually a, a great question. Thanks for that. Um, I have to say I came just before COVID came, <laughs> so I haven't seen much of Melbourne and Australia myself because we've been here in, in, in a lockdown situation. So in terms of um, building up relationships, uh, it's been also harder in these last one and a half, two years. Um, nevertheless, I, I feel like uh, if I have to compare between Germany, Switzerland or Europe in general and Australia, um, sometimes I feel like um, there is a uh, this connection between academia and research and industry that is much more clear um, and I can feel it much more here in Australia. I don't know if that's just my, you know, COVID impression of the country or is that real? So I feel that this is a, a major difference because the project that you saw uh, we, we were actually able to find engineering companies and people interested in investing in the project um, fairly easy. Whereas here in Australia, I find this being a bit more difficult. But again, not sure if it's just COVID or it's uh, in general. Would be uh, interested to hear more from you and your experience. Okay. Hey, no. Yeah, that, that's a returned question. So <laughs> uh, maybe I'll uh, hand it over to uh, uh, Rokus uh, okay. with the, the follow-up uh, question. I just let that go for a second. Um, no, thanks very much, Gagana and Paul. That was really interesting. And uh, there are a couple of, I mean, I could ask now many questions, but maybe one which uh, is maybe the one I picked up on was also from the first panel with Areti. There was often the word used interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary and that you know, the topics you investigate, they become utterly complex and in a way complicated. So in terms of maybe a little bit of what, what is the, the condition for you to be able to actually form these relationships? And Gagana mentioned the industry related one, but also Paul mentioned the research led teaching. So what is that environment you actually have at hand or have created is it all within your research hub or is it uh, is long term established relationships or are you going out and and pinpoint certain companies or are they coming to you so it's just like in terms of um because i think most of the research we saw today was driven by your interest your hub trying to direct a certain investigation so what are the conditions to have this multi and interdisciplinary conversation and involvement of other expert, experts within your schools or your hub? It's a really excellent com, uh, question, uh, Rockus. It's always, um, I think, uh, a difficult question also to, to find partners. Um, uh, it was interesting, um, uh, just perhaps in um, 
in contrast to the to the situation of, of moving to the university um, in Australia that was that was just brought up, uh, it had the opposite um, experience of moving from the university to the academy, uh, and that has um, that has really uh, I think been an interesting experience in the problems of finding partnerships and the need to find partnerships more broadly. Uh, here at the uh, here at the academy, we are an architecture and design school, and we do not have the the kind of easy ability to uh, um, to uh, to intersect with a, uh, a you know a, 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 an associated department or another school here within the within the academy, and that really means. Um, putting a lot more focus on on going out to industry uh, and doing that, or to other uh, related research institutions. So we normally we would always undertake um, research projects with partners. Um, those partners are often partners that we have worked with. Um, uh, for many years, uh, and then often not Danish, but uh, but are uh, through throughout Europe, um, particularly around um, uh, engineering. Um, we also work a lot with uh, other research partners, so with the Technical University here in Denmark, and there, I think, particularly around materials, we're finding. Right at the moment, there are very productive conversations opening up because around material science, also around robotics, uh, there is a real perspective that the built environment, the construction, that these questions are, are, um, are uh, that architecture can be an extremely interesting use case and application case for ideas that are developing in, in those fields. So I think there, there are, um, it, it, is, it is not, difficult to reach beyond the walls of the, the academy at the moment. Um, I think the other interesting thing from the teaching perspective is that we are increasingly having graduate students um, going into non-architectural um, employment, uh, going into employment with um, companies that are doing full-scale uh, 3D printing with concrete, for example, or working with other digital technologies. Uh, and the interesting thing there is that those students and the skills that they come in with are really raising the interests in those companies uh, who are then coming back and, and forming very interesting and very productive collaborations. So I think there, in, in the, from the, the, the teaching perspective, um, there is also a, uh, I think, a, a real um, sense that, uh, yeah, of sort of um, finding partnerships um, outside of the traditional uh, realm of, of architecture. But you've been at uh, Australian universities, so is that that kind of, uh, you know, the dedication to teaching as a part of investigation of research is that easier to accommodate in, like in you know, at the academy in, in Copenhagen, or what's the kind of the different setup? You know, it's I have difficulties imagining doing it with our master students. You know, working on yes. a project with industry because there's a certain expectation from industry, of course, that there will be also a certain outcome and not just a learning outcome for the students. So how do you balance this and or, or what is the, the difference in setup in terms of smaller student cohorts, uh, more dedication on time, more resources, more spaces, or can you? Um, yeah, yeah, I think there's a there's a, a really great structural difference. Um, I think the uh, the the and and that stems <laughs> maybe to to say it squarely that uh, that I have the ability here to set the educational curriculum for two years for my students. Um, and, and that can be tailored and adapted uh, as, it, uh, you know, as it needs to be, and it can be tailored and adapted in response to the research questions that we are delving into as a research center, uh, and also the students' perspectives themselves. Uh, we're, talking so that, about, we're talking master students here, aren't we, Paul? We're not talking yes, kids. Yes, master yeah. students. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, but that opens a freedom to allow those associations uh, to, to occur. Uh, so where we might take on, for example, um, a, uh, a specific questions from a, from a industry partner mm. um, uh, with, via a single student project or via a workshop or via multiple students who might work with that question over an extended period of time. Yeah. Gagana, from your experience, I think particularly potentially in Stuttgart, I think it's also master students who are involved. Yes, in this definitely. So I, I feel like uh, we as educators, because I spend a lot of my time in teaching these days, so we as educators really carry the responsibility to um, create that spark in our students to actually embrace uh, these new methods of learning um, and also equip them with skills to be more confident in jumping into interdisciplinary research and activities because our profession as, as architects it is not going to be the same in five years as it is now. It, it has changed quite a bit in the last five years already. So we need to educate people that are future ready, industry ready, but we need that connection between the industry itself. So we need to ask them, what do you, what do you need? Um, and try to fill the gap with, uh, with knowledge uh, and specific skills that um, we need to equip our students with. So we're always running or trying to go um, one step further, uh, predict what the future might mean um, or our future or the future our students would need in their future jobs. And this is very tricky and very hard too. So I think we come now to the final round with opening up across the whole conversation. And I hand over to Polo who will moderate that. But can I ask everyone to actually open your microphone now? And ideally, or I have that idea, maybe, you know, everyone from our guests like Flora and uh, Gargana and Areti and Paul, you might want to talk across um, your spaces and your institutions rather than us asking you particular questions. But I hand over to Paul and uh, we have like another 20, 25 uh, minutes for that. And then we come to a conclusion. Thanks very much. Okay. Thanks, Rokas. Thanks, guys. Thanks very much for your presentations um, to all the presenters. Or Gagana, Raiti, and Flora. Um, it's an incredible set of conversations and statements that you have presented. Um, we have looked so far at data that will augment and influence behavior and allow people to us project. We'll talk about social, cultural, technological impact of um, uh, research and innovations. We also talk about transfer of knowledge across disciplinary relationships, industries, partnerships. Um, and also materials of optimizations to digital fabrication. So I think um, I have this sort of interesting job of trying to pull all of you together into this interesting conversation. Hopefully, uh, um, by all means, um, hopefully I will just see some questions and you will just go ahead and make my job as a moderator so much easier. But maybe I will start with um, some kind of early questions around these notions, or maybe delve a little bit deeper, picking up on the last two conversations around um, impact and um, these notions of um, collaborations and partnership with industries between um, academia, as all of us are, in a sense, we are involving academia. I'm kind of interested in what Areti was talking earlier about having an environment, um, an environment that is suitable. And I think um, the notions of a warehouse for experimentation, the house experimentations. Um, if we bring it up to the larger kind of, um, say, um, notions of research as an environment, um, I'm interested in what um, all of you think about what future research environments should be, could be, um, and maybe if one, as, um, perhaps um, also kind of involving kind of Aretta and, and Flora who were already presented a, half an hour ago to kind of bring in this conversation of um, partnership. I'm interested in delving a little bit deeper into partnerships that I think Flora has established to numerous um, grants and also in RRTs in your 
institutions. And maybe down a little bit deeper you know, in terms of who leaks what, and I think this is what Gugana was also mentioning early, a bit earlier, how do we future-proof our education as educators? Um, do we let industry lease? And how do we know? I think Paul kind of very eloquently phrases some of the question is sometimes um, the information are already in the industry and you just need to go and dig it as a designer and try to make full use of it um, through the timber project, for example. I thought those are very interesting questions because you, um, in a sense, we are no longer, we are not only just using information that's already out there, but we're also trying to discover new, like say, um, difficult problem as Flora was trying to mention earlier. Maybe I'll ask Flora or Arati to start off. This is a really good um, uh, question. It's a bit like chicken and egg problem, uh, right? We could go to industry and um, hear their problems. And, you know, uh, when we actually are presented with problems, you know, uh, we can then, of course, come up with an uh, ideation uh, and design workshop to understand that. Um, actually doing it the other way around, like, for example, Gagana's approach on, you know, here's my cool idea and my uh, uh, invention and innovation, a, 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 a project that I'll, I think will be very innovative and let's bring industry who will chip in. That is actually a really hard, a harder approach, I will say. I've actually experienced both, both tracks. Either, you know, uh, I've got industry coming to me saying, here's my current problem, or they don't even know what the problem is. Here's our data sets. Could you find out what we can do with the data? Or uh, we've got people, uh, you know, uh, my usual collaborators uh, from, from other disciplines uh, that can include architecture, engineering, construction, or people coming from health uh, domain uh, and say, here's the problem that we think can be solved with data and machine learning. Can you help us? Um, but when uh, you have industry coming to you saying, I'm very interested in what the, the next big thing you're doing, that is gold and that is really rare. So <laughs> I think that's, that's the jackpot, right? We should, we should try both. Paul, I saw you muted, muting your mic. So maybe would you like um, to help Yeah, you? sorry. I, I think it's because there was some background noise. But the, the one thought that I had was that perhaps it is also important to maybe be working simultaneously with both near and far research horizons and to think in parallel about the, also, I suppose, the way that those relate to partnerships, uh, particularly to industry partners. I think often the, the question that industry comes to with is related to a, often to a near, um, a near horizon or perhaps an incremental advance, um, uh, whereas perhaps some of the other research that we were seeing here today is also reaching out more uh, to longer horizons, um, uh, uh, to uh, further horizons, um, and is perhaps more uh, ground, uh, grounded research that can inspire uh, partnerships and industries. Um, but I think uh, the productive um, place to be, at, the, at least our experience, is to be working at the same time across, across those multiple uh, horizons. Um, uh, because they can also inspire one another and because also the partnerships, of course, can, can bridge across. Um, we have also had just recently a, um, I mean, a piece of research that, uh, that we published about um, and thought had, had sort of been lost with the midst of time that we have had the experience of industry reading about that through our publications and coming, uh, being very inspired. Uh, and, and coming into contact uh, because, because of that. And that research, we thought, was really far horizon <laughs> uh, research. Okay, thank you. Arati? Yeah, I, I, I have some thoughts on that. I think this is a very, very crucial question and not easy to answer because there is not a recipe, of course. But um, I'm very interested on, on what you said in, in, the, in the sense of envisioning the future research environments. No, I think this is maybe uh, the most interesting part of that question for me, um, because um, the way that we do research is changing. 
And um, the way that industry is searching for innovation uh, is also changing. I remember many years back, um, um, especially in Europe, uh, industries had their own research departments, no? and they were only uh, working on research related to um, their kind of their, their production, no? like to, to somehow, I always call it um, to redesign the bottle of water, to make it more ergonomic, to make it more beautiful, to make it more sustainable, to use some more, um, uh, you know, like uh, um, recycled materials. And, and that was a model that uh, slightly, uh, I mean, slowly, slowly, it started to change. And now what is becoming very interesting is that those industries are searching for other kind of spaces, academies, for instance, where they can help them design, not redesign the bottle, but rethink the way that we drink water. So they are searching for innovation in a kind of a more radical way. They know that this innovation cannot come from their own ecosystem because the way they operate is much more different. It's very much focused on certain limitations from budgets, from annual budgets and, and, and uh, objectives to different kind of operational structures. So in that sense, I feel that this kind of future research environment involves the collaboration of industry and academia uh, and other stakeholders where they all together work, not on making a product better, but really starting out of scratch, new ways or new products in relation to, uh, um, to, to different kind of, of architectural production. And I think this is the most interesting part because, um, um, you know, like, um, optimizing an existing process or an existing product would have a significant impact, but the biggest one would come for these new um, ideas. And um, I am also interested, I mean, with Paul and with the, with the group of CETA, we are also, uh, we have been participating and we continue to try to participate in different European funded research projects. And I think this is another platform where academy together with industry, together with administration or policy makers, they come together to form a team where they produce ideas that they then become pilot projects. And I think that these kind of fundings are important because it's not about uh, disrupting the way that an industry is working in terms of operation, but it's opening up a window of research with external economy and funding so that new ideas could emerge. And I think that those processes are also very fundamental at that moment. With uh, Australian partners, we are also um, uh, working on, on, on trying to achieve uh, uh, some partnerships and some funds uh, on that. So this exists in a way, not only in Europe, right? And I think that's important. And last but not least, I, I, I was also thinking that um, the way that the industry uh, is being formed is also changing. The, start, the startup ecosystem that is emerging allows for the creation of smaller industries, uh, uh, smaller practices that they don't have necessarily um, the, let's say, the amount of, of, uh, of a capital that big industries have, but at the same time, they have the space to innovate in a very radical way and, and find supporters to try to you know, um, uh, implement new ideas. And I think that this ecosystem of startups would become another very significant uh, um, part of this new uh, or future uh, research environment. And, and um, uh, in, in our case, we see it every time more and more that our students are working on research projects and then they are trying to create their own startup. They are trying to create their new profession or their new practice that as Paul was saying at, at certain moment, it goes beyond the typical and the traditional architectural uh, practices or architectural offices or digital manufacturing, uh, um, uh, let's say um, setups. So uh, the, this new startup ecosystem is, is merging disciplines in a very unique way uh, and it creates new kind of services um, um, that follow, let's say, on the one hand, the digital revolution, on the other hand, 
uh, the, the unprecedented challenges uh, we're facing. So there is a kind of a very interesting landscape there uh, mm. in relation to industry, um, collaboration of industry with academy and innovation within the field. Thank you, Raj. I mean, I think what you say is really spot on because I think, I mean, I myself experienced through my own research, this sort of um, leading to a startup um, and we actually spin a company off one of our um, patent projects uh, the uh, last two years ago. So, and, you know, precisely what Flora was saying, you know, this very difficult chicken and egg scenario. And Gagana, I'm really interested to hear your thought about this new environment of uh, research that we can create here. Yeah, no, that's uh, absolutely fascinating. So I, I think the, 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 there is um, more blurring happening uh, nowadays. So blurring between disciplines, blurring between research and academia, and it's an exciting, um, it's an exciting time to, to innovate in. Um, it's also becoming very hard to innovate and come with amazing ideas just because there is so much that it's going on at the same time right um so maybe one thing that i was uh that i want to highlight is um maybe the need of more uh open source uh collaborations and open source tools and research that are um, available to everyone um i think software engineers do that quite well uh everything is open source everything is shared um Perhaps we in architecture need to catch up a little bit with that, uh, in my opinion. Perhaps um, it's happening already in some parts of the world. Maybe need, some other parts of the world need to catch up even more. But I think this um, idea of sharing research, sharing findings, um, as I highlighted with my project, uh, sometimes uh, an invention in one field can lead to innovation in another one. So you, you never know um, when you come up with an idea, how, how many people are you actually influencing by it? So I think that's um, also an important part to be more collaborative and more open source. I think that's um, super interesting, um, just to kind of level collaborations. I want to just move on bouncing off that ideas onto um, the next area, which is, and in the sense, all of us shares um, uh, fascinations, uh, um, almost a love-hate relationship. I can see sometimes with technologies. We know that it's going to lead us somehow to innovations because it enable us to do more um, through AI, through um, fabrication, different methodology of fabrications. I mean, what we're clearly, uh, clearly, clearly seeing here, especially to kind of what Paul was describing in, in terms of the research done in CETA, is this um, a kind of a formal a move away from the kind of the formal, from the kind of the workflow process in fabrications um, to works um, in the sense what Flora is already doing for many years, this notion of agents-based systems to kind of looking at material, at data, both of agents and having agencies. Um, of qualitative and quantitative agency. I thought that discussions earlier on big, fat, small data <laughs> oh, um, is actually super interesting. I'm, I'm wondering whether we could also, um, and I'm trying to all the presenters here, whether we can elaborate more in terms of how some of this shifting of thinking towards um, material practice um, in architecture or digital practice and sort of data practice is also starting to shape, shape the way that we started to innovate or move towards different models of innovation and teaching. Paul, perhaps I can invite you to start that off because it's in a way something that you are already looking quite closely in CETA. Um, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Paul. I think, it, I mean, it's a fascinating topic that you open up. Um, and I was also, I and mean, it was incredibly interesting for me to see Flora's presentation, to hear the ways in which um, she was gathering data, but also describing different kind, the different natures of, of data. Um, I think that one of the, one of the, um, I think you're, you're very right that, that, um, that sort of, um, you know, beginning to shift from um, perhaps standardizations or standard models around material, around, uh, also the way that material is represented within 
architectural um, design processes uh, is, uh, is certainly, um, there are new pathways uh, are beginning to form at the moment based on data rich practices. Um, I think for us, one of the one of the challenges is how to gather those data sets for around material. Um, I think that uh, um, they are particularly the, the sort of challenge of how does one move from, from either synthetic data sets, which can be generated quickly and at scale, uh, from that world to, to worlds where you, you're working perhaps with much you know, much less data. Um, uh, how does one how does one actually do that within a fabrication process, within a design process, um, and how do you do that also at a at a at a maybe a at a pace and with a precision that that makes sense from a design you know that that maps onto a set of design objectives as well? Because I think also for this this is where it, where it comes back to is that you know is data. You know, of course, it's wonderful, but its real point is to be an enabler, yeah, of, of a of a of a you know of a of design intention of design practice. Um, so I think there, I mean, we have already within our education here, we run courses in the design of data sets and data set curation, uh, where we introduce students to different modes of, of generating data, also of making hybrid data sets and different ways of, uh, of also understanding what are, what are good data sets and, and, and you know, how does one want information or features distributed through them. And that is certainly, I think, one part of it is beginning to think about how those things might come into architectural uh, education. Um, but I think also, you know, it, it's obviously also a very fast moving field at the moment. And, uh, and I think that um, you know, it becomes particularly important that we are also um, uh, looking to connect out to, to Flora, for example, or her colleagues um, also to, to understand what, um, how methods that are developing in those fields could be, could be useful for, for fabrication workflows or for architectural workflows. Flora, I think he's already leading you to the next, <laughs> to talk. <laughs> Thank you. That's a really um, a nice connection. I just want to say that uh, there's also a, a movement now. Um, I, I mean, our field has is moving really fast, uh, and there's also a, a movement also about learning from less data. So um, uh, you know, having more is not necessarily always good because the thing is, of course, we know the issue with uh, deep learning is very expensive. It can it burns a lot of fossil fuel on the server, so it's not sustainable. Um, so how do we learn from less? And um, and uh, some of my recent projects are focusing on that learning from less data or learning from even requiring a really well curated data. Um, so learning from the wild, really. Uh, and I'll I'll be very happy to talk about some of uh, examples. And, and also it actually in fabrication, one of the most recent collaboration we had was not with large scale fabrication, but nanoscale fabrication. So um, we actually uh, work with a uh, nanotechnology engineer to design the best optimal way on printing nanotechnology materials. So um, using uh, uh, just uh, generative models of, uh, 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 in, uh, based on neural network. So um, that could be again something that uh, I'll be happy to uh, discuss, and uh, you know, if we reach out. Um, and I think one one thing that I I I want to say is we we're really learning from each other, and I think COVID, um, as well as climate change, uh, opens up uh, I think the more reason for us uh, to collaborate. Um, you know, uh, if we don't collaborate now, when? And I think it is very important because there's more pressure on. Uh, industry to collaborate because this uh, minim uh, the resources getting minimal. Everyone gets busier at, at, uh, in the hybrid life of work <laughs> and being at home. So I think there's so much pressure on uh, everyone. So I think the more we can uh, communicate, the better because it's uh, the problem with the life right now um, that we are constrained in our in our silo. We're no longer as connected as before in like conferences or 
all these different things. So this is really wonderful that you have, you know, um, you know, you have someone, an outsider from your discipline in this panel. So I'm really happy that uh, I'm, uh, I'm invited as part of this discussion. But uh, at the same time, uh, how do we make this an active or a normal part of our life uh, where we communicate the, uh, continuously uh, having a conversation uh, beyond our discipline? Uh, and, and, and for me, I think that was very interesting when I hear people's uh, problems from other discipline and see if we can borrow something. And at the same time, uh, lastly, I want to mention, uh, even the way we did our teaching, we learned something from the design schools. So we only started recently, we're starting programming studios. Uh, normally we have only courses with specific course uh, subjects, like, you know, with specific lectures and labs, but because the field's moving really fast and we have to be more agile, we're just naming it now programming studio and we make it, we're making it more current and we run it the way like design studios are being run. So I'm actually, we're learning from you guys too. So, so it's, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's really cool if we can collaborate more. Thank you, Flora. I, I, I'm, I'm glad that we are uh, designer are now suddenly becoming more appreciated because uh, Leda and I are running um, a, a micro search that's coming up soon on design thinking, and we're probably the one of the few designers that's actually leading design thinking course in business school, apart from business school. Um, Arati, on that note of collecting data from the wild, this notion of ecology, you mentioned several times already in your statement. I'm really interested to hear your thought on, on this the kind of the future progressions of data and, and also this notion of ecology, which is again much more complex. You know, Flora talked about the small, and I think super interesting that the ecology is again another layer of complexity. No, it is. I I think that um, um, in in your question um, there was uh, this. Uh, let's say important aspect of um, data driven design agent based design and then and and then uh, you also mentioned the fact of of you know materials are coming back to to become something very significant in our in our discipline our discipline is um, um, one that is very close to materials although the truth is that the concrete revolution the steel revolution has somehow um uh you know like uh, became the protagonist of of every other you know uh, exploration in materials and and i think that when it comes to um combining data with materials for searching more uh, sustainable ecological uh, models uh, it becomes very interesting the fact that we're moving away from the traditional let's say hylomorphic uh, model or Newtonian model of, of matter, where matter is being, um, let's say, subject to an external force in order to become form. And, and now with all the uh, technologies that we have in both computational design, simulation, uh, but also the fact that we are able to prototype in advanced laboratories, uh, uh, we are in a way able to uh, deal with matter in a different way. Um, uh, we're able to understand the micro scale of matter, the properties of material. We're able to gather data during the process of creation of new uh, materials. And, and I think that this is very fundamental in order to innovate uh, in the aspect of, of uh, ecological design. Matter is fundamental. The way that we have been designing and constructing the last um, um, 100 or 200 years uh, is not anymore uh, sustainable. So alternatives need to enter the game. I think uh, uh, Dergana was, was sewing some of this work as well as Paul. And, and uh, it's, it's very important to, to be able to um, yeah, uh, combine um, data with uh, new materials or with processes of, of new material forming. And then, um, in, I mean, we are also working with uh, uh, biomaterials and 100% natural materials. For years now, we're researching how to uh, combine robotic technologies, additive manufacturing and, and natural materials such as soil. And, and we know that um, we are able to create um, highly aesthetical work, but also, you know, structural uh, work. And, and it's not always easy um, to um, get to change the mentality of people in, in terms of what they want as a final product, you know? Like we see 
um, uh, many times that people, they kind of like that we are 3D printing with robots, but they will kind of prefer concrete from soil because that's how they're used to have their environments. And I think that this is another issue in relation to change mentality, not only in the way that we do uh, um, uh, our practice in design, but also uh, the users that they are receiving that design and, and, and we need to, mm. to work on that. And then there is another uh, category of projects that we're working on in the last uh, two or three years, which has to do with um, monitoring um, data in order to understand buildings as, as material banks. You know? So instead of... Um, instead of, of using natural materials, timber or, or you know, like uh, soil, we also have plenty of materials in our cities. And, and if we manage to uh, monitor uh, this matter, then we can, um, you know, create designs that they upcycle the existing materials that we can find uh, on, on sites that they are to be demolished, for instance. Uh, we can diminish, uh, diminish the impact of, of um, um, the waste uh, that we're producing in the construction sector and their data on the form of the matter, on the properties, the structural uh, properties of the matter, um, um, the condition of matter, data on, on this is, is becoming very fundamental in order to create new material libraries from where to decide what kind of uh, blocks or materials could be reused uh, within a circular economy and circular design thinking. So um, I think these are, you know, um, a new um, aspects on, on ecological design that merge um, data, that merge a new, um, um, let's say, um, material awareness, uh, as well as a kind of a new design process with matter. Yeah, that's certainly, um, I mean, I think Gogana simple materials, you already say it's the next move. Yeah, definitely. I, I wanted to reflect on what I already mentioned with um, new materials and, and, and simulations, uh, because I, from my experience, can, can say that, you know, we always look at simulations as um, the ultimate uh, the ultimate goal, the, the thing that would solve all our problem, problems. But when you deal with the new material, you have to inform your simulation in some way. And norm normally you do that by um, informing it with the physical properties of the material. And this you can only extract if you do physical experiments. So it's kind of a loop that you need to follow. Uh, and I I'm, I'm almost sure that physical experiments come first <laughs> and then you go all the steps around and, and they inform each other uh, back and forth. But I, I found something uh, really interesting if I may go back to uh, Flora's presentation, because when we speak about big data and thick data and using data as, as, as our design driver, as, as you wish, if you wish, um, I found it interesting, she said, we need to ask the right questions. And this I find extremely difficult in architecture because we have um, our, in our nature as architects is to create our own problems <laughs> in a way. So that's how we think. Uh, we, we, we create our own problems that are amazing. Uh, and then we re work really hard to get solutions for these problems, right? So. I, I would probably be interested to, to hear not more and learn more about your approach in finding how to write the, the how to ask the right question. <laughs> That's really interesting for me. So I'd also like to come back to that conversation and to, uh, to Flora's actually prompting us to continue the conversation. I think tonight is more like to get to know each other, to, to start a conversation for our audience, to tap into some particular topics. But I think this is an opportunity, as you kind of said, you know, to work across institutions, which is often the more difficult one, and to collaborate across disciplines. Um, we could go on for a long time. I'm aware of the time. So I think let's hope that this is a start of a conversation and not a conclusion to come to and something we like to continue 
my big question is always then at the end, what does it mean for our educational system and our university and what do we actually teach students? Because it's kind of often based on a traditional model. Um, I leave it to Paul to conclude the con moderation. Well, just before we go, I think Dominic has one. Hopefully, yeah. um, some of our colleagues he can pick it up. Go, uh, I Thanks so much. Thanks, Paul. Um, I just briefly wanted to come back to what you actually said earlier, Paul, about our role as educators. And uh, my question is, how do we shift the designer's mindset from vanity to agency? Because that's another theme that I've seen with all the presentations today. And we've seen quite a number of examples of, of how that might play out. But I see it also as incredibly difficult in an environment where the majority of uh, like students we teach um, and the way we teach uh, and I'm not pointing fingers at, at anyone. I think it's, it's someone I would include myself. It's very frequently still uh, as educating the sort of architects in, in our case who will produce these sort of glory projects, if you want. And um, what I could see clearly today and what I see more and more emerging in, in my research and in my teaching is that we need to look more into agency and educate the new sort of custodians of the environment, the built environment and beyond. And how do you make that shift? How do you go and, and, and achieve that? Maybe that should be another panel discussion we're going to organize as the hub and to, to focus on that particular aspect, because I guess, I mean, coming back to your know, many presentations tonight, especially Aretis, that was the focus, uh, you know, you said, what is it for, what we're designing for. So, um, but I think I, I like to thank everyone for joining us. And I like to thank Paul Law for moderating this conversation amongst our guests. And um, I hand it over to Paul to maybe make a final comment on the discussion. Yep. Thanks, Rokis. Thanks, Dominic. Um, I think what, um, what we discussed today, uh, what we just talked about in terms of disciplinary knowledge and how we share discipline knowledge across multiple fields, multiple um, terrains, and, and the futures of research as a form of laboratories. Um, is super interesting and these notions that we started to open up as discussions around experimentations and what disrupt experimentations and our practice and what we didn't really talk about directly and perhaps indirectly we did is this notion of affordance and how all these research and innovations allow affordances for us to design either better city, better life, better living environment more interesting data sets perhaps um, from Flora's point of view or um, using less, less data. Um, so I thought there was a very rich set of uh, conversations that we had today. And um, I think I'm just gonna echo what Roka said earlier. I think one would like to see this as kind of the start of a conversation that we can perhaps continue across institutions. So Rokas, I'm gonna hand it back to you and Leda to conclude. So um, I just like to thank uh, all our guests, Areti, Flora, Gargana, and Paul, also our hub members, as well as the support team, Philip Anak, James Rafferty, Si Shen Wong, and Sarah Brockersby. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. I think it was a great conversation, and I really seriously hope we can continue it and uh, offline and with smaller groups, with larger groups, and maybe someday in a virtual, not just in a virtual space, but in an actual space. And uh, let's make it an open invitation to our guests uh, from Europe to come and visit us. And certainly to our guests, Gagana and Flora from Melbourne, and we will do vice versa. Thank you everyone. And I think it was a really rich and great conversation.